India celebrating the successful moon landing of its Chandarian 3 spacecraft. As well as being a technical triumph, uh, the success of the landing at the lunar South Pole opens the door to exploring uncharted territory, an area scientists believe could hold vital reserves of frozen water. A solar-powered rover will collect a data there for the next uh, couple of weeks. India's success comes just days after Russia's Luna 25 craft crashed into the moon. Mission accomplished. Chandrayaan-3 landed on the moon at 4 minutes past 6 p.m. Indian Standard Time. At Mission Control in Bangalore, the relief was as great as the celebrations. The same went for Prime Minister Modi at the BRICS summit in South Africa. This moment is the fulfillment of the heartbeats of 1.4 billion people. It gives us new energy, new belief and invigorates our country. Celebrations too in the planetarium in the capital, Delhi. It's just a few days since a Russian mission crashed at the lunar South Pole. Now the Indian mission will start collecting data. That kind of a data will be used for other space programs. In the coming time, probably, we can use this data to take the human back to the lunar surface and also in other uh, planetary missions. India now has big plans for its space program. A manned space flight and the construction of a space station are in the pipeline. Those will be followed by unmanned missions to Mars and Venus. Well, Dr. Namrata Goswami is an independent uh, scholar of space policy and great power politics. She's also co-author of Scramble for the Skies, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space. So welcome to the day, Doctor. A uh, big day for India, right? Yes, yes, it is a big day. Also because, as you pointed out in your report, it's because it's the first time that a uh, mission has actually landed on the South Pole. There were missions attempted earlier. India tried to land in 2019. Russia, as you know, attempted to land just a few days ago. And so given the fact that the South Pole terrain is so difficult because of the lack of data, so this mission's success makes it an enabling mission for those lunar missions that are going to come, say, in the next few years. So, yes, it's a big day for India. OK, and, and a lack of data uh, about the South Pole, but, but the South Pole somewhere uh, that uh, countries want to get to particularly. Just talk us through why that is. Sure, because uh, the South Pole of the Moon is that area of the Moon that has resources like water ice, that can be turned into oxygen for supporting human habitation. It also has resources like titanium, iron ore, aluminium, magnesium, that can be utilized, for example, if you want to set up a base on the moon. So that is why, especially many countries are interested in that particular area, including the United States, China, Russia, and now India. So that makes this particular area so strategic because it enables uh, missions that India will have to now look forward to. For example, India is a partner to the United States Artemis Accords, which it just signed in June. And the Artemis Accords actually wants to be able to do resource utilization missions. And so that is why the South Pole is so critical for those particular missions that are going to come in the next, say, five to ten years. Okay, so it's quite a, a, a list there of, of uh, minerals and uh, elements that you, uh, that you listed there. And these are important, aren't they? These are, these are, are useful in uh, electronics and clean technologies. So just, is it now going to be the Wild West? Does anyone who can get there get to keep whatever they can stuff in their pockets? Or are there rules, uh, international treaties? So there are agreements, for example, you have the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 that uh, enables you to utilize space, but you cannot claim sovereignty, it's very clear, and India is a signatory. So are all the Artemis Accords uh, countries. China is also a signatory and so is Russia. Mm -hmm. So you already have rules. Uh, you also have the Moon Treaty, which has not been ratified by India or any other major spacefaring nations. So going forward, the hope is that you have an accord like the Artemis Accord that lays down the principles, the norms, and the responsible behavior that countries have to agree to when they sign it 
when they uh, basically invest in missions that are looking for commercial uh, capability on the moon. So right. we are not there yet in terms of clear consensus. Right, no, that, that was the, exactly the point I, I wanted to just clarify. We're not there yet at the moment, just because it looks technologically so far away. We have time, but anyone who can get up there fast can at the moment just fill their boots. Yes, because, uh, for example, for India, this is the first time that it has actually landed on another celestial body. So that means that the Artemis Accord countries have the capability real time to do the kind of lunar missions they hope. Uh, China is going to the South Pole of the Moon next year with the Chang'e 6, which is a lunar sample return mission. So there is a rush to the South Pole, given the fact that it has such strategic significance. And as you said, it is a little bit first come, first serve. So whoever gets there first will have an advantage, the first mover advantage, yes. like you have in low Earth orbit. And, and does it necessarily have to be a country? If someone super wealthy like Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos uh, wants to have a go at setting up a moon mining company, would they have to apply to someone for a licence or can they just have at it? So, according to the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention, states are responsible for the behaviour of their private space actors. Right. So. Even if, say, as you asked the question, even if, say, Elon Musk or Richard Branson wants to go and uh, do a moon mining activity, they still have to get the license from the state they are registered to. The liability convention makes the state that they are registered to liable for anything that can go wrong. So in the current regulatory framework, they will have to get permission from the states they are registered to. They just cannot decide on their own that, oh, we want to go and set up a base and we will do it. We've already seen, though, just this month, in fact, in, fact, in, the, in the last uh, week or so, we had Russia's Luna 25 uh, mission heading for the moon's south pole and actually overtake uh, Chandarian 3 before it crashed. So this sounds like an actual race with such high stakes. It sounds like there's little incentive to, to, to trust any sort of international space traffic control. It sounds like if you can get up there, you, you get up there and, and the devil take the hindmost. So with the Russian Luna 25, so it was a mission that was planned for several years and it has been delayed. And they also took a much more shorter trajectory to the moon. So they launched much later than India and tried to get there fast with more fuel. Uh, and, of course, lost because of the propulsion technology misfiring uh, when they tried to enter the elliptical orbit. So I think because Russia's Luna 25 had such critical political implications, one, because uh, Putin wanted to showcase Russia as remaining a major space power, also to create legitimacy for his regime. And the fact that it crashed undermines that particular desire of his, actually raised the stakes for the Indian space mission for it to succeed because India signed the Artemis Accord. Now, uh, it, it looks like a strategic alignment because it's happening. Russia has joined the China-led International Lunar Research Station and is collaborating with China to set up a research base on the moon by 2036. China already has the capability to go to the moon and land there autonomously and dock. And now India has it. And India, of course, has signed the Artemis Accord led by the US. So there is a rush. Uh, at this point of time. And that's why it is extremely important that we have regulatory frameworks and normative guidelines that are going to determine how these missions play out. Fascinating. Thank you so much for outlining that so clearly for us, Dr. Dr. Dam Namrata Goswami. Thank you. Well, the day was full of excitement for families across the country who huddled together in front of TVs and computer screens waiting to watch their country's uh, space ambitions make history. The W's Manira Chowdhury met one such family in Delhi. Excitement is building within the Sharma family. India's lunar mission is about to attempt landing on the moon's south pole. Shalini is teaching her daughter about Chandrayaan-3 where is it landing? On the moon. On the moon. <laughs> While her husband is telling their son, Juan, about previous lunar missions. Juan is an astronomy buff. He's especially thrilled. A little bit nervous and I'm a little excited. 
I've been waiting for this a long time. I'm discussing with my friends and um, I'm really excited. It's time. Everybody's on edge. In just a few moments, we'll find out whether Chandrayaan 3 will make a successful landing on the moon's south pole or not. After a nail-biting half an hour, the mission successfully makes a soft lunar landing. <laughs> Elation everywhere. We were waiting for this moment since morning. I was waiting for my kids to come home so we can sit and be a part of this historical moment. This is what it means for me as a parent that no, my kids should feel proud no matter where they study, what they study. They should be proud of being part of a nation which is there on the world map now. I will definitely celebrate, probably we'll go out with family, with kids uh, to celebrate this. Uh, and we really enjoyed, uh, especially me with my son, researching about the uh, previous uh, expeditions. But this time it really landed well and we're very happy. India has made history. It has become the first country to land on the South Pole of the Moon. Social media is buzzing with congratulatory messages for the thousands of Indian space scientists who made this possible. Shalini and Vinay are happy they could share this experience with their children. The family's interest in space exploration has gotten a big boost now that India has finally arrived on the moon. Let's pick this up with Keith Cowing. He's an astrobiologist, a former NASA employee and now editor of spaceref.com. Uh, welcome back to uh, DW, Keith. Uh, how important is this success for, for India and its standing in space exploration? Well, you know, I, I'm so pleased to have heard that introductory piece with the, with the Sharma family. Uh, that was me as a young boy in the 1960s. I mean, I, precisely the same reaction to things. And uh, as the prime minister said today, you know, that this isn't just India's alone. It's the global south now that can achieve these things and they can all aspire to go to the moon and beyond and that the sky is not the limit. So to me, that is the most important take home. It may be a little esoteric, but sometimes you need this sort of really strong enthusiasm to make these amazing things happen, and they have it. And Russia's mission to the same region crashed just a few days ago. So explain to us how difficult it is to, to pull off this kind of mission. Yeah, well, as they say, this is rocket science. Uh, it is not easy to land on another world, and you usually have to practice. The difference is, is that India has been building up its capability over the past several decades, and uh, it stays in practice, whereas the Russian probe, they have been trying to launch that same mission for like several decades, and they hadn't really had a lot of practice. So uh, the old adage, practice makes perfect, and I think the Russians were a little bit more laying on you know, past achievements, whereas the Indians were very cautious and methodical, and it, it worked perfectly for them today. So, and, and the South uh, Pole is particularly significant because this is where uh, ice is thought to be. Why is that important? Well, when we went to the moon the first time, you have to bring everything with you, uh, air, water, rocket fuel, whereas water, you could either use it to drink, you know, or you can break it into two components and make it into rocket fuel or oxygen to breathe. So every pound you don't have to, every kilo you don't have to bring to the moon is, you know, one you can save. And you can also make it a lot easier for more people to spend more time in the moon, which is the whole idea. You want to learn how to be able to live in the moon for a long time before you go on to planets like Mars. Good talking to you as ever. Uh, Keith, thank you so much for joining us. Keith Cowing, editor of spaceref.com.